Something green pops up where we didn't plant it and we're supposed to kill it, right? Right? But what is this little thing? And where did it come from? Oh. A weed is defined as a wild plant growing where we don't want it. But if we don't know what it is, how do we know we don't want it? And what if someone does want it? Birds have been landscaping long before us, and they vote with their, with their butts. I would love to attract more birds to my garden, so I'm trying to pay better attention to what they're planting. There are three parts to this weed question. One, what is this wild plant? Two, should I kill it or keep it? And three, what if I decide to keep it, but I don't want to keep it here? Here's my process for answering all three. First, we need to be able to ID any weeds in question. And we'll hit both easy and hard cases, so we'll need tools for both. For the easier plants, you can get a quick guess using an app. There are several plant ID apps meant for a few different purposes, but so far my favorite for weed ID is PlantNet, since it's completely free and I've found it to be the most accurate for your average plant ID. To ID your weed, you just take a photo or two and upload them to the app, and it will return a list of possible matches sorted by how confident the app is in its guess. PlantNet's best guess for my weed is a sedge called Thin Fruit Sedge. It shows 53% confidence in that guess, which is actually pretty good. And the next best guess only has a confidence of 2%, so not even really a close contender. One source of error with these apps is if other users misidentify their own plants. These apps rely on photos from lots of positive IDs that they can compare your plant against when searching for a match. So if others misidentify their plants, it can unfortunately corrupt the process a bit. And some plants are just harder to ID, like the one I'm working on now that has a lot of potential lookalikes. For these cases, Facebook groups like this one might be able to help. These groups are filled with garden enthusiasts who will try to help you ID your tricky plants. Here's the holy grail. Someone posted a photo asking for help to ID a plant on their property, and lots of people weighed in with great excitement to confirm they'd found an endangered species. 40% of plant species are at threat of extinction now, so at this point, it doesn't hurt for all of us to be on the lookout for this scenario in our own gardens. I posted my weed to this group and was very surprised to get four votes for Liriope, which is weird because PlantNet had Liriope like eight guesses down. But Liriope has glossy green leaves, whereas Thin Fruit Sedge has powdery blue leaves, and so does my plant. I'm all for resisting our AI overlords as much as the next guy, but I'm afraid I have to go with the app on this one. Okay, so we've ID'd our plant. Next question is, why did Bird Butts recommend this plant? And is there a reason for me to keep it? Here, the distinction between native and non-native plants is really helpful. If it's native to your region, then your land is part of its home, which explains why it showed up in your garden. And native plants, insects, and birds form beautifully complex ecosystems. If you find a keystone species, these are plants that provide a disproportionately large amount of ecological value and are definitely worth consideration for keeping. Specialist host plants are another keeper because they have unique relationships with our pollinators and can't be replaced by any other plants. This Garden for Wildlife site from the National Wildlife Federation is an awesome resource to check for both keystone and specialist host plants you can be on the lookout for. Because non-native plants aren't part of your local ecosystem, I don't hesitate to pull them. In PlantNet, if you click on your plant match and then hit this K at the top of the page, it'll link you to your plant's entry in the Q Plants of the World database. It's a very helpful site that will show your weeds native stomping grounds. You can sometimes also use this Q database to check if your plant species is at risk. Usually I see my weeds are in this least concern category, but just because it's not endangered, that doesn't mean some of the insect species it supports aren't. Plus, by definition, species of least concern are about all we have left, and many of them do have incredible habitat and ornamental value. All right, so say we have a weed we think we wanna to try to keep, but it's in the wrong spot. Wrong spot, again. Really, it's the same as getting a package in the mail. What is that? If the delivery person doesn't bring your package to exactly the right place, you don't go running outside and beat the devil out of it. Oh, wait, you just move it and put it in the right place. So that's what I've been doing with my weeds. A patch of evening primrose showed up in my shade garden last fall. It's not endangered, but it is a specialist host plant. So rather than just pull them all, I transplanted five to a different garden bed where they would look better. And I was glad I did. It's a fascinating plant. Its flowers open at night and are mostly pollinated by moths. And it's a host plant for the evening primrose sweat bees and for the primrose moth. When I first saw pictures of the moth, I didn't understand why they would be pink since the flowers are yellow. But if you look at the flower stems, you can maybe see why. Also, songbirds like goldfinches love the seeds. And watch this. You need a long proboscis to get to the nectar of these flowers, like butterflies, moths, and hummingbirds. So when I saw this carpenter bee flying up, I was really confused. 
But look at this sneaky bee. It's not going to the flower for nectar, it's stealing it, tapping right into the side of the flower instead of going through the front. Apparently this is called nectar robbing, and it was sure fun to discover. Some say this plant is a bit assertive, but it's a great plant, and honestly it was very easy to transplant and remove the extras. While this weeding process does take a little more time, it's also how I've started to reconnect to the plant knowledge our species is fast losing. Fostering genetic diversity is crucial for resilient ecosystems. So cut out the middleman, save a few bucks, and let the birds bring you some free plants. And since we've been on the topic of specialist pollinators, I stalked the bees around my rhododendron mercilessly this past spring, and what I learned absolutely blew my mind. Watch this video next to check it out.